Al Jazeera podcast. Saturday's protest against the Israeli war on Gaza drew in massive crowds in Washington, D.C. It was likely the largest demonstration in support of Palestine the U.S. has ever seen. They descended on Washington by the tens of thousands, pro-Palestinian protesters from across the United States. Signs and banners have been left here outside the White House, some reading Free Palestine, others reading Genocide. The anger brings in voters that are key to the Democratic Party's base, including Arabs, Muslims, Jews, young people, and progressive voters. Many are furious about the Biden administration's unwavering support for Israel. We stand with Palestinians. This is a genocide that needs to end. Enough is enough. It can't go on. And we need the White House. We need Biden to listen. Out of the 535 members of the U.S. Congress, only a small group of 18 progressive members has called for an immediate ceasefire and for humanitarian aid to be allowed to enter Gaza. The liberal wing of the Democratic Party is calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. It's sponsored by a congresswoman from Missouri. That's creating division within the Democratic Party. Centrist members... People are angrier than they've ever been. So... How likely is U.S. policy to change? And what will it mean for Biden if it doesn't? I'm Kevin Hurton, in for Malika Bilal, and this is The Take. I'm Ali Harb. I am a senior producer for Al Jazeera based in Washington, D.C. I cover U.S. foreign policy and domestic politics as well, with focus on Arab and Muslim communities in the United States. Okay, well, Ali, um, it has been a pretty historic weekend in the U.S. There were lots of protests, drawing big crowds, most notably on Saturday. I wonder if you can just give us a sense of what the atmosphere was like. The atmosphere was a lot of energy, a lot of anger at the protest calling for a ceasefire in Washington, D.C. on Saturday. I exited the metro and headed towards the crowd. And the first two signs I saw at the protest on Saturday, it was one that said Genocide Joe, referring to President Joe Biden, And it was another that showed Vice President Kamala Harris with a phone in her hand and Biden on the other side, mocking the call that the then Vice President-elect gave to Biden in 2020 when their election was confirmed, saying, we did it, Joe. And, And the speech bubble said, we did it, Joe. We are funding genocide. And those two signs so early on, those were the first things I saw there were tens of thousands of people, a crowd stretching several blocks in the heart of Washington, D.C., a sea of Palestinian flags, people chanting for an end to the war, people chanting for ceasefire, but also people chanting in anger at President Joe Biden and his administration, accusing him of enabling genocide in Gaza, and expressing in no uncertain terms that they will not support his re-election campaign, no matter what the political realities are, because of what's happening in Israel and Palestine right now. And a year out from the election, polls indicate support for Biden is down in swing states. It's also down among Arab Americans. In Michigan, they make up a big enough part of the voting population to be a possible swing vote in a swing state. The Arab American Institute said it found Biden's support among Arab American voters has plummeted from 59% in 2020 to just 17% today. When you dig into those numbers, Biden is down. And I think that's what keys in on what you were seeing in Washington at those protests. It's that his own voters are saying they are not coming to the polls. Is that what's really worrying the Biden reelect? So... Here's, here's what's happening. 
Biden is not winning over the other side with his stance on Gaza. But his own base, and you know, we talk about Arab American voters, we talk about Muslim American voters, Mm -hmm. but there's also the progressive base. There's also younger voters who are a much bigger, larger chunk of the electorate than Arab Muslim voters. Young people, people 18 to 35, they're not happy with this. And from anecdotal evidence from the people I've spoken to Saturday's protest, from people I've spoken to in the Arab American community, it's not necessarily that people are not voting for Biden and running to vote for a Trump. A lot of people have not decided. They they just don't know yet, but they do know that they're not voting for Biden. And I spoke to a Lebanese American woman yesterday, and she told me they, as in not just Joe Biden, but Democrats, have no more votes. Not from me, not from my family, not from anybody. It's done. The rationale that Biden is the better choice will no longer work. Mm. And I will recall that at a time when Palestinians are dying, at a time when we are seeing the mass graves, at a time when we are seeing the children getting pulled out of the rubble, Joe Biden's response, the response came from the president himself was, I have no confidence in the numbers that the Palestinians are releasing, doubting them even in death. Huwaida Araf is a Palestinian-American human rights lawyer and a longtime activist. She says that people, more than ever before, are coming to understand the U.S.'s double standards when it comes to Palestine. We've seen mobilization across the United States and really across the world like I think we've never seen before. Massive demonstrations from Chicago to San Francisco, Minneapolis to New York, Detroit to Washington, D.C. We're also seeing disruption, school walkouts, congressional office occupations, occupying congressional buildings, taking over Grand Central Station, blocking boats carrying supplies to Israel. And this is not even to mention the explosion of social media activism that we've been seeing. So, Ali, it does seem like the overall idea is this anger. And, and, and maybe you could just expand a little bit more on why this feels different from other instances in the past regarding this issue. So I I would say there's absolute outrage amongst people who follow Israel-Palestine closely. While many people found it's legitimate to express sympathy to Israeli civilians who were killed on October 7th, and it's normal for America as an ally to express support for Israel in that hour of need, two things that angered people a lot. One was disconnecting October 7th from the broader context of the conflict. This is U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan on October 10th. I'm not standing up here to draw red lines. What I'm standing up here to say is that in its hour of need, as Israel embarks on an operation to try to protect its country, protect the Jewish state of Israel, and to go after the threats that it faces. And to say that Hamas is ISIS, and this is just a brutal, abstract act of violence that is not connected to anything that's happened over the past 75 years with American complicity. And the second is that there was no expression of sympathy for the Palestinian lives lost. There was no, not even an acknowledgement of that early on. And you add to that, early that week, the week that followed the October 7th attack, there were calls in Congress for a ceasefire. That resolution was sponsored by Missouri Congressional Representative Cory Bush. To my colleagues in Congress, I urge you to choose humanity, choose peace, Choose love, choose courage, and join this resolution now. And those calls came from two or three members of Congress, one of whom is Palestinian-American Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib, 
who put out a statement saying that she condemns violence against civilians and she grieves for all innocent lives lost. And the White House is asked, what do you think of those statements calling for a ceasefire and not showing support for Israel? White House uh, spokeswoman Karine Jean-Pierre uh, says, We're going to continue to be very clear. We believe they're wrong. Uh, we believe they're repugnant and we believe they're disgraceful. There can be no equivocation about that. There are not two sides here. There are not two sides. She uses the word repugnant. And many Palestinian rights advocates in Arab and Muslim communities and Palestinian American communities and progressive communities and amongst young people, they heard the word repugnant and they thought, she's talking about us. She's calling us repugnant for calling for peace. So that early reaction really registered with people. And that was compounded by the unprecedented level of destruction that we saw in subsequent week that Israel unleashed on Gaza and on the people of Gaza. It's been 30 days, 30 days of relentless Israeli bombing of the Gaza Strip. And in the last few minutes, it has intensified even more, especially in the central parts of Gaza. Refugee camps have been targeted, hospitals, uh, United Nations shelters. United Nations experts are warning of the risk of genocide, Kevin. This is not an activist who's angry and using sound bites. United Nations experts are warning of genocide. And the administration's response, the Biden administration's response, was to send aircraft carriers to the Middle East to flex its muscle in support of Israel, to call for $14 billion in aid for Israel, and to show unwavering support for Israel. And the White House says we're not drawing red lines for Israel. So, of course, people are beyond outraged. People are appalled, I would say. So, is the Biden administration beginning to wake up to this new reality? That's after the break. Let me ask you this, Allie. It does seem that the Biden team is waking up to this reality. They've, they've seen the marches. They've seen the sentiment. They've seen that their base is reacting in a very specific way. What are some of the steps the Biden White House is taking to address the strong feelings here? So there's been a rhetorical shift, and I would trace it back to when a Palestinian-American six-year-old child was stabbed to death by his landlord in a suspected hate crime because he was riled up by what's happening in Israel. The Justice Department is launching an investigation into an alleged hate crime in Illinois, where a six-year-old Muslim boy was stabbed to death and his mother was injured over the weekend. Police in Plainfield Township, southwest of Chicago, say the victims were chosen because of the recent attack in Israel. The shift started with more emphasis on quote-unquote minimizing civilian casualties in American officials' statement, with more emphasis on respecting the laws of war, again in quotation marks. We started seeing emphasis on delivering aid to Gaza, and we started seeing more and more talk about combating Islamophobia, and later came the more specific calls about combating anti-Arab bigotry and anti-Palestinian bigotry. But so far, the policy has not changed. If anything, the Israeli bombing campaign has intensified, coinciding with this rhetorical shift from the American administration. It's been about a month since Hamas attacked Israel, killing more than 1,400 people, mostly Israelis. Israel's military has responded with weeks of attacks in Gaza. The bombings have now killed more than 10,000 Palestinians. So when I'm talking to people, and I get spoke on Saturday to a ton of people, and, and one expression kept coming up, too little, too late. This shift is not registering with people. 
and I would say, in fact, it's having the opposite effect because people see it as a sort of cynical, dishonest approach while maintaining the same de facto policy on the ground in Israel and Palestine. You know, it's interesting because the Israeli administration was clearly caught flat-footed militarily, but it, it seems like the U.S. administration, the Biden administration, has been caught flat-footed politically and that there are shifting sands here. President Biden is in an unenviable position. He's got a young base that is more politically aware, I would say, than any time in, in the recent American political history. A base that's engaged, a base that's that knows what's going on, a base that's searching for the news from its own sources away from the mainstream takes on foreign policy that you get in in large media conglomerates. And he has to deal with that base as well. Some progressives, Arab, Palestinians, Muslims say, this is not about politics. This is about humans. This is about the risk of genocide. And if the president cannot see the commander in chief, the person that they elected overwhelmingly three years ago, on the premise that he is this decent guy who wants to preserve the soul of the nation, cannot take a courageous stance to stop the killing of children by the hundreds daily, then why should we support him? One of the issues, I think this almost compounds one of his biggest liabilities, which is his age. And I think this speaks to a lot of older Democrats is that they see Israel a lot differently than people of a different generation. The idea of a two-state solution is much more distant, if not completely dead. When you were there at these protests, did this feel like you, you could almost not see a way forward for the president? I mean, I didn't yesterday, but after seeing those poll numbers today, yes, I I do not know if he will survive politically until November. Wow. Those poll numbers are damning. And you compound that with the anger in the streets, with how alienated he is in his own base, and how, frankly... He doesn't enjoy even a devout following within people who support him. When he was elected in 2020, he was elected on the premise that he will restore the soul of the nation. He's an alternative to Trump. Without Trump in the picture, I don't know what's holding this big umbrella, this coalition together of the Democratic Party. And I would like to add that even people who do not support the Palestinian cause, even people who would identify as pro-Israel, they don't want to see American troops at war in the Middle East. And we saw some flashes of that with those aircraft carriers in the Eastern Mediterranean. You know, I, I just don't know, even if the U.S. said, look, this is threatening our alliances with these Arab countries, you got to stop. I just don't even know if they could even if they wanted to. I would I would disagree with that because the United States has massive leverage. So if the United States just said you need to stop, they won't stop. Because the United States has, has been saying stop building settlements. They keep building settlements. The United States right now says weekly, almost daily, I will get you almost daily statements the settler violence in the West Bank must stop and we condemn it and Israeli government must step up. Settler violence gets worse because the Israelis know there are no consequences. But if Joe Biden says we will return those aircraft carriers, we will stop the flow of weapons, we will stop the flow of aid, we will reassess our relationship with you if you do not stop, Maybe maybe they, the Israelis will not stop immediately or the next day, but it will give them a lot to think about. And that's The Take. 
This episode was produced by Khalid Sultan, David Enders, and me, Kevin Hurton, in from Alika Bilal. With Amy Walters, Chloe K. Lee, Faranisa Kampana, Sonia Bagat, Miranda Lynn, Sari Al-Khalili, and Ashish Malhotra. Alex Roldan is our sound designer. Alexandra Locke is the Take's executive producer. And Ney Alvarez is Al Jazeera's head of audio. We'll be back. <laughs>